All right, let's, let's continue with uh, this no small disturbance here uh, in Ephesus. I actually think this is one of the most interesting things in the book of Acts. Okay, all right, so remember that Paul and the church, probably not just Paul and himself, but Paul and the entire church over that period of two years had made such an impact in Ephesus. And Ephesus had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people there um, that uh, people who made idols or idols, uh, like idol makers and craftsmen, silversmiths, were going out of business. That's how effective they were. Okay? It was affecting the culture um, in, in actually kind of a, a, an interesting, interestingly uh, social and economic flavor. All right, so Demetrius also argues that if Paul were to continue in his success, that the goddess Artemis would fall into disrepute. Let's see. Um, somebody read uh, verse 27, please. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province, Asia, and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Yeah. So we, we indicate, uh, we, we see in the text indicated that uh, Artemis worship was not just localized in Ephesus, but there are a lot of other people that would go to it. Um, Artemis being a fertility goddess, uh, would be particularly uh, fond of women followers who had trouble bearing uh, children childbirth. So they would pray to Artemis, and Artemis would bless them in their childbirth and the raising of their children. Um, there's actually some, some indi indicators of this in uh, 1 Timothy, because 1 Timothy is written to the church in Ephesus. Ironically, we know more about Ephesus from 1 Timothy than we know about the book of the Ephesians, which is not written to Ephesus for some interesting textual reasons, but that's just, that's beside the point here. Um, we have another surviving inscription in Ephesus, which tells us that, uh, this is actually like, like coming into the city. Since our goddess Artemis, the leader of our city, is honored not only in her own household, whom she made the most illustrious of all the cities that are owned by nature, but also among Greeks and barbarians. So uh, we can see that even, that even the Ephesians himself would praise Artemis for being um, powerful in her city, but even in other cities as well. That's such a surviving inscription. Um, we know that our revenue from the Temple of Artemis was used to pay the local roads and streets in Ephesus, indicated, uh, or sorry, indicating, excuse me, indicating the foundational role which the temple played into the economic and commercial structures of the city. Okay? I want you to kind of consider in your mind the Temple of Artemis as the equivalency of the Jerusalem temple within the Jewish faith, for the Jews, okay? For the Ephesians, the temple of Artemis was as the Jerusalem temple was for the Jews in the first century, okay? To bring its revenue into question was to attack the fabric of the city itself, okay? This provokes the listeners to rage, who turned to chant a ceremonial acclamation to Artemis, which says what? When I heard those that were filled with rage, they began praying on saying, Great is Artemis of the Yes, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, okay? All right. The rioters, they grab Gaius and Aristarchus and bring them to the outdoor theater. This theater, by the way, is the location of the public assembly. The word here in Greek is the ecclesia, the gathering, the gathering place, okay? Place where the word church does not mean a building. It means place outside. It means the local gathering of people, okay? It's funny. It's for, the, for the Christians to use the word ecclesia, the word for church, of them, they would be taking a word which means the town gathering, the special the special meeting of the town gathering and use it for themselves. All right? Um, so why, why did they grab Gaius and Aristarchus? And who are Gaius and Aristarchus? Why did they grab Paul? Gaius, according to 1 Corinthians 1.14, was personally baptized by Paul in Corinth. If he was already here in Ephesus, this would mean that Gaius was baptized in Paul's secondary missionary journey and somehow made his way back over here. Okay? Aristarchus is from Thessalonica. We learn this in, in the next chapter. He eventually relocates to Colossae, uh, which uh, we see Paul gives greetings to him in Philemon, chapter 1, verse 24, and Colossians 4, verse 10. That's who these guys are. They're Paul's missionary people. All right? These two names mentioned here indicate that Luke does not tell us all the details of Paul's traveling companions in Acts, especially when they joined Paul and when they departed, because they just show up in the, in the city, like, out of nowhere. Like... You know, we've already seen before, where's, where's, uh, where's Timothy, um, where's Silas, Luke kind of jumps in, Luke jumps out, we're going to see in chapter 20, Luke jumps back in, Paul doesn't tell us all these details, okay, what do you do, because it's not the major part of this, okay, 
Um, the outdoor theater in Ephesus could hold approximately 24,500 persons on the three tiers of seating. Here's a picture of it today. Uh, you can go to Ephesus, you will go visit this, okay? It's, I mean, hey, for, for something built, you know, um, this is actually probably built uh, obviously earlier in time that was depicted. That's pretty good for them, okay? You know, so you would sit down here, and this is all these people, these, these tourists that are sitting here. And of course, people sitting here, I'm like, oh, this is where they brought these people. Paul wasn't there. <coughs> Paul was probably like hiding over here or something, I don't know. But they brought guys and there's like this. Um, people say, oh, this is the place where Paul traveled. Well, we don't know that Paul went there. But you put a lot of people in that, in that thing, okay? And I mean, you talk about a town gathering, that's a town gathering. You know, that's an arena, okay? The structure is really cool. It's so even and everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let me tell you, people think that ancient people were idiots or that they were like not sophisticated. We haven't changed our ways of construction. No, like, no, no, no. no. Well, you can see that here. Like, here, here's, a, here's a picture from someone like down here looking up at what it looks like. Actually, the picture's a little expanded, but, um, you know, they, a lot of it still stands. I mean, so. Pretty cool looking place. You can kind of sit down there. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, there's, there's tons of pictures. I mean, lots of You should go visit this. It's one of the, it's one of the few places, like, <laughs> I, I tell people all the time that we know there's a church in Ephesus, and then uh, Jesus talks about it in Revelation chapter 2. He says, if you don't um, if you don't get back to evangelizing, I'm going to come and I'm going to take your lamppost. And you go today, there's no church in Ephesus. It's gone. Okay, that was gone. But the theater still stands. Yeah. Is there a specific name for the same theater? The theater in Ephesus? I don't know. It's just it's all. It's just the Google Ephesus Theater. All you'll get all those pictures there. Okay, I did not take those pictures. I colored them myself. <laughs> That's a joke. All right. So uh, we see some of the local rulers, by the way, um, in verse thirty-one. Some of the Asiarchs. Interesting term. It's a rare term for rulers in Asia. Asiarchs who were friends of Paul, they notify him of what is taking place and insisted that he not come forward. This shows that Paul and the gospel had even reached into the, the government of, of Ephesus. He had some of the, the Asian rulers um, who were believers. Okay, um, The riot appeared to be out of control. Even to those gathered there, uh, there, they were unable to comprehend why they had been summoned to this impromptu meeting. Um, and now verse 32, someone read verse 32, please. So then some were shouting one thing and some another. And the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. Yeah, so they're coming together. They didn't know why they're there. Right? Just some people were shouting and, hey, something to do. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. More chanting occurred for a period of two hours. Two hours they're just sitting there chanting and stuff like this. Okay. Remember how Jesus talked about how the pagans, they, they honor their gods with vain repetition? Here's an example. Vain repetition. All right? Um, for the town clerk, this guy is, is he called, is he called the town clerk? What is he called here in the name ASP? Um, the, oh my goodness. Yeah, town clerk. 35. Yeah, town clerk. Okay, town clerk. Okay. This is the, he's a high-ranking person in charge of the Ephesian city meetings, okay? Uh, it, it's translated from the word, uh, the, the grammatus, um, where we get the word scribe. He's, he's actually an official person in Ephesus, high-ranking person who can take charge of these meetings. All right? Um, he quiets the crowds, you know, calm down. He orders the assembly to calm down and do nothing rash, 1936. These are undeniable facts. You ought to keep calm, do nothing rash. Okay? Since guys in Aristarchus are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers, then the reason for the assembly is called into question. That's what's the summary, verse 37. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our gods. Yeah, okay. Let me, um, which is funny because, like, uh, in, in the Christian community, they would certainly say that, uh, you know, the god Sardis is not a real god. But publicly, they're not publicly blaspheming the gods at this point. Um, okay. Um, something that you want, also want to know here, too, I didn't put this in here, but in verse 35... Actually, I'll pull this up here in the Greek so you can see what's going on here. All right, somebody read uh, verse 35, please. Um, after quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there, after all, who does not know um, the 
that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven. Okay, this word for uh, guardian, guardian of the temple, is this word uh, neokoron, okay? Um, it's a very, very rare word, but it's a temple keeper or a temple guardian. And what happened was, is that Rome, at the request of certain cities, um, Rome would give the cities the authority to build a temple to the emperor, okay? And one of the interesting things that Ephesus, because it was one of the major cities in, in Asia Minor, was given this privilege to build a temple to the emperor. And they would call this particular temple um, the, the Neokoron. Okay? And so they were like the guardians of the temple. And it was a privilege that they had from Rome. But the interesting thing is that the, um, <clears throat> we talked about this before, the cities would request this privilege. They're like, can we please build a temple to, uh, to the goddess Roma or to the emperor or to the emperor's family? And Rome would say yes or Rome would say no. And uh, over the course of the history, Ephesus um, received this privilege something like four or five times and actually by the time of the first century they had received this this um, this privilege twice uh, there's actually a book called uh, Ephesus is twice um, Neokoros it's actually a book and talk about how the, this privilege was there it's an expensive book by the way it's like a hundred dollars um, but uh, we talked about how um, you know they would only be worshiping the uh, Artemis they would also be worshiping the Emperor this is one of the major cities that had multiple temples, depending on the time period, um, authorized by Rome that they wanted to build in honor of the emperor and the emperor worship, okay? And so one of the things that they're saying is, look, um, hey, you know, we're the city, we're, we're one of the temple, right here, the NRSV, we, uh, we are the temple keeper of the great Artemis, okay? So they would, they would, uh, they would understand it in that way. But this, this, this very, very particular word here uh, is a significant word for um, the privilege that Rome would give for a city to build a particular temple um, uh, in honor of the emperor. It doesn't, it, you, you would read past this and, and miss it if, if I had pointed it out to you. Okay, um, what else do I want to say here? Okay, um, all right, since Gaius and Aristarchus are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers, and the reason for the assembly is called into question, formal complaints can go to the local courts, that's what they say. Uh, verse 38, somebody? So then, <laughs> someone. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another. Okay. So we got particular places where you can bring courts, but don't just start an impromptu riot that leads out to the city. Okay. All right. Um, now Ephesus is not a colony, not a Roman colony. They're a free city. Okay. How do they have their freedom? Rome granted them their freedom. Okay, they're free to be self-governed. All right, that's what a free city is. Um, the Roman so being what? The Roman dictators like Philippi, right? No, they're not a Roman colony. But they're, they're not trying to imitate Rome. Not, not deliberately. They, they they have been given freedom to, to govern themselves. Uh, they're, they're different than a Roman colony in that sense. Okay. They're not an established like extension satellite campus of Rome. That's what I would call a Roman colony. Um, so being a free city, and by the way, this freedom was a prized privilege for Rome, Ephesus could not hold legitimate public meetings without consulting Roman authorities first. Since this gathering was unscheduled, and therefore unlawful, it would appear seditious to Rome, thus threatening their free status. Okay? All right? They were not allowed to gather without Rome's approval. So this impromptu gathering, how would Rome look like it? Oh, you guys are gathering without telling us? You guys are probably planning sedition. Okay? And Ephesus did not want to appear this way, okay? Because they had this, this, uh, this freedom from Rome that they could lose at any point, okay? Um, now, here's something else that's important. I looked this up, and this actually makes the most sense as to why he responds the way that he does. Ephesus had twice already, in the first century, been investigated by Rome in matters surrounding the Artemisian. What's the Artemisian? No. Is the Artemisian? I already said earlier, it's the temple. It's the temple of Artemis. It's called the Artemisian. Okay? They had already been investigated by Rome in matters with this temple. Okay? One, for offering asylum to dissenters. The temple would offer asylum to people who like dissented against Rome. That doesn't look good. Okay? And second, for the charge of corruption in regard to Ephesus proconsul um, in the year 44, like less than a decade, uh, or I guess, depending on the time period. Probably, yeah, 
10, 12, 12 years prior to this. In other words, by the time that the incident of Acts 19 occurred, the Temple of Artemis could bear no more negative attention from Rome for fear of losing its privileges. Okay? So this is why the town works like, whoa, what are you guys doing? There's not really a big issue here. There's, there's, you know, handle your issue in court. There's not really a big issue here. We are, um, verse 40, for indeed we are in danger of being accused of a riot. Accused by who? Well, accused by Rome. In connection to today's events, since there is no real cause for it in the connection, we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. Another way of translating that is the word is unlawful gathering. They could not lawfully do this. Okay, so after this, they dismiss the church, the assembly. Okay, that's what's going on here. So you see how, like, understanding the culture and, and understanding uh, the significance of Artemis, that city, understanding the position of this town cooler person, and understanding the charges <coughs> that have already been placed upon the Artemisian helps us to understand what's going on here. But, if you're a reader of this, you think, oh, Christians, yeah, they're involved in controversy, but they didn't start it. It was Demetrius who started it, it was a bunch of rioters who started it, yeah. and in the end, this, uh, this town official, this, uh, this town clerk, said that they're not guilty, let's move on. And they dismiss it. Okay? By the way, by the time of the, um, the beginning of the second century, the emperor had, um, had outlawed these sort of gatherings. He yeah, outlawed these gatherings, and that, but we actually see that Christians were meeting it anyway. That's cool. Okay, um, I gave you this this uh, this map before, but it's really really important to see uh, what's going on here, um, because like if you read, um, okay, so right now Paul is in Paul's in Ephesus. Uh, the orange is like where he goes, and then the um, the purple is where he goes back. The orange is in Ephesus. If you look in chapter 20 and verse 2, we see that uh, when he had gone through these districts, he had given them much exhortation when he came to Greece. In that one verse, Paul does this. It goes all the way to Greece. Like, and you're like, how in the world does he do this? So this right here is a guess. A guess. And we know that he went through all of these districts, and he picked up a bunch of people, because you see in 20 verse 4, he picks up Sopater, Berea, Phiphorus, and Aristarchus, and, and Sig. Condus of the Thessalonic, Thessalonians, Gaius of Derby, Timothy, Antichius, Antichius, by the way, shows up in uh, Colossians and Philemon, and uh, uh, Tro uh, Trophimus of Asia. He was, uh, he was a good looking guy. He was a trophy guy. Um, but you see, like, he picks up all these people from these places. That's why they reconstruct this, which is a scholarly reconstruction, and we can see that it's probably he went to those places first. But he, he basically just you know, uh, Luke kind of fast forwards, like, rip, 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 you know, fast forwards all the way through and gets there. And but it's kind of, it's really. I want you to have an appreciation and a sense of the Roman world. Like, I hope that by the end of this class, um, you will know a few more things about Syria, Antioch, about Tarsus, about Ephesus, about Philippi, about Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth. I hope you'll know some th some things about these these particular places. And they help you to understand what goes on when Paul writes letters to these communities. Anyway, so you have that now. Okay, now we're moving to a new section, chapter 20, which actually goes rather quickly. <clears throat> we're going to see. This is the journey to Jerusalem. Okay, by the time he gets to the end, 21, 16, that'll be the end of his third missionary journey. I mean, Paul had, his, this missionary journey was a long journey. Like, long in distance, but also long in time. Okay, the scary nature of the riot would have discouraged many of the Ephesian Christians. I mean, if you just saw that two of your people almost got lynched in a public mob, how would the church feel at that point? Okay, they're scared. Okay, they don't want to speak against Artemis anymore. So Paul exhorts them. So I'm going to read chapter 20, verse 1. After the emperor had seized Paul, sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave with them, he left to go to Macedonia. Okay, you can understand why Paul... In response to that, and remember, Paul wasn't there. He was kind of watching from a distance. Um, why Paul would gather all the Christians together there and exhort them. What do you think he would say to exhort them? Huh? Get the right thing. No, no, no. Well, he, that's only just two people. He, he's now gathering the entire church. Only two people were, were at that riot. 
Yes, yes. He would say, hey, stay faithful. Don't compromise. Don't fall away. Like, re remain focused. Be on the alert. Like, he would say, hey, you've got to maintain your faithfulness because times are getting rough right now. That's what he would exhort them to say. Just like we saw in Acts 14.22. Okay? He soon leaves from Macedonia, although he makes many stops on the way. Acts 20 verse 2 summarizes the long journey in which he ends up in Greece. The uh, three months in 20 verse 3. He spent three months there in Greece. There's a plot formed against him. Okay. Um, based on the timing, it could either be in the winter of 56, 57, or depending on how you calculate things in the winter of 57, 58. And according to 1 Corinthians 16, Paul had intended to stay with the Corinthians during that time. He can actually read it where he says, hey, I want to stay with you guys during the winter. Okay? By the way, winter was a time when there was no sailing that would take place due to the nature and the danger of the storms and the wind. Like everyone just knew you do not sail during the winter. So Paul, that's why Paul stays there for the three-month period. So I'm just doing that so you kind of get in your mind a little bit of a chronology of what's going on here. Okay? So Jews plotted against Paul, so what else is there? <laughs> yeah. All right, deterring his intended trip to Syrian Antioch. All right, you see where it says there? Three, he was about to set sail for Syria, but he decided to return through Macedonia. Through Macedonia. Okay, so um, he could have sailed directly. This is Syria, Syrian Antioch, but he wants he takes a different way. Okay, so we've already seen that through persecution that would shift where Paul is going to go. Okay? And he wants to go to Rome, but man, he keeps, you know, getting sidetracked, okay? Um, at this point, he gathers a few traveling companions, one of whom is Luke, 20 verse 5. How do we know that Luke is in 20 verse 5? We. Yes. Not we. Us. Us. Well, it's yeah. like us. Yeah, us in verse 5, okay? And then we in verse 6. So Luke just kind of shows back up there, all right? From Philippi, they traveled southeast to Troas. You can, you can look at your map, you can kind of see... Philippi is up here, Troas is kind of way over here, okay? And this occurred after the festivals of unleavened bread. I also put here the festival of Passover, okay? We know that that happens in the springtime, okay? So, um, let's see what I put there. Uh, okay, yeah, verse 6. So we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. So where did he celebrate the Passover? He didn't have to go to, to Jerusalem. He did it there. Okay. Um, this, if, if that, if he stayed prior um, in, oh, where is he? Greece. If he stayed in Greece during this winter period, um, then the following spring would be where the Passover is. So this would be, you know, the winter going from like November, December, January. So this would be like spring, Jan or spring of 57. Or, December, or November, December, January, and so this would be the spring of that particular time period. I'm, just, I'm keeping a chronology for you to see this, okay? And this is how scholars are able to date the letters of Paul um, and, and, and to get out an idea of, of, of early church history, all right? So Paul spent the Passover with the Philippians during a seven-day stay in Troas, so he's not gone from Philippi all the way down to Troas. The believers are gathered for church. Exodus says they're gathered to break bread. When was the last time you just gathered to break bread? Yeah. Oh, okay. Did you read? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. <clears throat> all right. Um, and they did this on the first day of the week. By the way, first day of the week, a phrase given without qualification, indicating this day had been established for some time now. He, when, when Paul creates a new Christian community, he does not have them meet on the Sabbath. He has them meet on the first day of the week, because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. It's a commemoration day of the resurrection. Ironically, is that a lot of people they meet on Sundays and they, they, they don't even think about the resurrection of Jesus on that day. Which means they're missing the point. Now you can meet whatever day you want. If you want to meet on Tuesday, that's fine. But they did it on the reason why they did it on the first day of the week is obviously to commemorate the resurrection. Okay. A poor soul ended up falling out of the window to his death. Two reasons are given for this tragedy. One, Paul's long-winded sermon. And two, the drowsiness caused by oil-fed lamps. You ever had a kerosene lamp in, in an indoor no, place? No. Yeah, the ker uh, kerosene or oil-fed lamps uh, give off a uh, chemical that actually causes drowsiness. It's actually a, a known medical thing. So, um, so we fall, it's not that he's falling asleep because he's bored. He's falling asleep because why in the world would they say 
there were oil fed lamps there if it wasn't significant. To make sure that there's hey, his name's so funny. Yeah. I mean, good fortune. Yeah, his name is his name is Lucky. <laughs> his name is Lucky Dog. Yeah, yeah. All right, Paul runs down from the third floor, throws himself upon Eutychus. His name's Lucky. All right, um, Paul raises him from the dead, and then returns upstairs to eat and finish talking. I, I know if you read the text, you might not get the sense that he raised him from the dead, but um, in 20 verse 9, he's called dead. He picked up dead. And then Paul falls on him, and he's like, oh, look, his life is in him now. You know, his... He's now back alive, so the sense of resurrection. So Paul could raise people from the dead. Jesus raised people from the dead. Paul raised people from the dead. Who else raised people from the dead in the Old Testament? Elijah. Elijah. And? Elisha. Elisha. In fact, one of them, they, they, someone's like, uh, someone touched the bones of, of uh, the dead Elisha, and I think they came back to life. I think yeah. somewhere like in the second They like passed out or died onto the bones. Oh, yeah. The yeah. bones came alive. Yeah. yeah. Now, a dead person. Resurrected somebody. Yeah. <laughs> it was a spirit. Definitely a spirit. I think there are three resurrections in the Old Testament, three resurrections during the ministry of Jesus, and there's three resurrections um, after, um, after this time period. So Jesus is not the only person that does that. I don't think there's any significance of three, but Okay. Um, okay. He raises from the dead, returns upstairs to eat and to finish talking. Okay? Um, from Troas they sail to Assos and then they sail to Miletus, okay? Um, that should say Miletus is farther south, not farther south, farther south. You look at your look at your map again. Okay, right here. So they were there. Um, they went to Troas. That's where uh, the lucky guy fell out of the window. Then they go to, to uh, Assos, and then they go all the way down here to Miletus. You know what city they skip? Ephesus. Ephesus, which is the most like logical port. It's like a major port city there. That's the question. Why in the world would Paul skip Ephesus? Because of all the riots there. Yeah, people know him. And you know, um, and here's the thing: we um, we we don't. Uh, you don't actually see this. We just know from the Book of Acts that Paul he spends three months preaching where? Three months preaching in Asia Minor. In Asia Minor, but who's he preaching to there? Three months. Three months where? Let's pay attention, guys. Come on. Ephesus. Yes, he's in Ephesus. Okay, to, to, to whom is he preaching for three months? Oh, the Jewish leaders. In the synagogue. Okay, oh, three yeah. months in the synagogue, and then two entire years in the um, in, in, in the uh, hall of Tyrannus. Okay, um, but we don't know what happens during that two-year period. We just know there's a couple story about the seven sons of Sceva and the riot and and the burning of the stuff or burning of the books, the scrolls. Okay, but if you read some of the other letters of Paul, we know that there was some imprisonment. We know that Paul was in prison in Ephesus. Okay, in First Corinthians, Paul says, "I fought wild beasts in Ephesus," which is a way that uh, particular people uh, who were rhetoricians would describe that he had a, a, a tough uh, theological debates with. He didn't like literally fight wild beasts, but um, and then we know that he uh, <clears throat> spent time. We can also see that he spent time uh, in prison in Ephesus. And so when we have the prison epistles uh, in the Bible, which are Colossians, Philippians, Philippians Philemon, and 2 Timothy. Um, the question is, to, uh, from where is he writing this imprisonment? Or where is he writing these letters, okay? These would be early if he wrote them from Ephesus. If he's writing them from his imprisonment in Rome, which is around the year 61, then they'd be later. So, and then some people actually think that he was in prison in Caesarea Maritima, according to some place in the book of Acts, but that's kind of like a rare third option. You might not think none of that really matters to your Christian faith, and you're probably right. But I'm interested in the history of this stuff. Okay. You're probably right. So. All right. Um, okay. All right. Well, lucky guy there. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I wrote here that. Um, Miletus is farther, farther, F-A-R-T-H-E-R, farther south from the logical port of Ephesus, which Paul desires to avoid, likely because of the threat of persecution. Safely in uh, Miletus, which uh, it says in, in 20 verse 14, it says they came to um, uh, Mytilene, that's kind of a region, but the, the city is called uh, Miletus. Um, 
Uh, he summons the elders of Ephesus unto him. Why in, Eph in, in Miletus would he summon the elders of Ephesus? Because he doesn't want to go there. He's afraid, so he gets them to come to him. It's interesting. Okay. And then he has a lengthy farewell speech. Okay, farewell speeches are a known literary form, both in the Bible and outside the Bible. Okay, they can be observed in the Hebrew Bible. Jacob gives a farewell speech in Genesis 49 to all 12 his sons. Uh, there's a, some people actually consider the entire book of Deuteronomy to be Moses' farewell speech. So Jacob in Genesis 49, Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, Joshua in Joshua um, chapter 23 and 24, Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 12. Um, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of them outside the Bible, too. Luke organizes the speech with these common elements, recollection of past and of relation to the audience, his discharge of debts, he's going to take leave, he's going to appoint successors, exhortation to remain faithful, and he's going to commend them and bless them. Okay? The, uh, by the way, the mentioning of the elders in Ephesus indicates that this function, the function of having church elders, was established as early in Ephesus as the year 52. That's the earliest that we can possibly guess that Paul was in Ephesus. Okay? Some people think that church structure was late. That's in the pastoral letters, which are later, some of his later letters. But here we can see it technically as early as 52. Okay? If you're just being honest with what the book of Acts is saying. <clears throat> What else we got? Okay. In this letter, Paul recalls his humility, his tears, and his trials. Why? So, so you think his tears, how do you think his tears are related to his trials? Yeah. I mean, he got, he got pushed around a little bit. He was, he was in prison. Okay. He also reminds them that he did not shrink from declaring them that which is profitable through Repentance. Uh, Someone read verse 20. Um, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable in teaching you publicly and from the house to house. So I'll read 21. So only testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, okay. So I was declaring to you the things that are profitable. You know what all scripture is in 2 Timothy 3? All scripture is profitable. profitable. So he's preaching out of the, the Hebrew Bible, the scriptures there. He was teaching them publicly and house to house, solemnly testifying, Jews and Gentiles, that they need to have repentance towards God and their faithfulness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, how did they repent towards God in Ephesus? They burned their They burned things and made presents. And had to deal with Artemis. Yeah, they stopped worshiping Artemis, and they obviously would stop worshiping the Emperor Paul. Okay, so repentance is not—I feel bad for my sins. It's making a cutoff from these things, and he was solemnly teaching them about this. Okay, so we don't have to guess what he's talking about there. We already have the episodes in Acts 19 to demonstrate that to us. Okay, um, he says that. Um, Someone read uh, 22 and 23. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. Yeah, bonds and afflictions await him in every city. That's another indicator that he was, you know, arrested in Ephesus. In every city. So the Spirit, I mean, what a job. The Holy Spirit tells Paul, you're going to be arrested, you're going to be afflicted in every city. Have fun. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, he also understands that his conversion is a course which needs to be finished or fulfilled. Same word, 20, 24. I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. What is this ministry? To solemnly testify of the gospel, the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, you will no longer see my face. Okay? So he was given a job from Jesus to preach about God's grace and to preach and to herald the kingdom. Okay? Um, by the way, there are some people that will talk to you that say, oh, Paul only preached grace. Paul only preached grace. But they don't read the next verse where it says that he was preaching the kingdom. Okay? The gospel of grace is the same thing as the message of the kingdom. Okay? 
You know what Luke 12, 32 says? Luke 12, 32. Luke 12, 32 says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, Fear not, little flock. The Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Chosen gladly. What is chosen gladly to give? That's grace. So, so Jesus preached grace. That God has, has gracefully decided to give you the kingdom. And Paul also preaches the gospel of grace, which is the heralding of the kingdom. Okay? That's why when I asked you to, to memorize the, the, king, the kingdom verses in Acts, I asked you to memorize uh, verses 20, 24, through 25, not just 20, 25. Okay? Because there, there are some people that just say, oh, Paul preached grace. He didn't preach the kingdom anymore. And what they do is they put 24 out of its context of being next to 25. Okay. Um, talked about this last week. He draws on the Ezekiel's watchman metaphor. He declares his innocence due to his faithful preaching. Um, verse 26, he says, I testify today I'm innocent of the blood of all men. All men? Really? All of them? In Asia Minor, it says that he, you know, that his gospel had reached the ears of everybody. So he's, he's, he is innocent of the blood of all those people. Okay? And also, you, in the Christian community, you can be innocent of their blood if you feel like you have teach, you've taught them everything that they need to know. Okay? Uh, the elders, by the way, are considered... Um, uh, overseers, verse 28, guard yourself from the flock among, uh, among which uh, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, or bishops, overseers. So the, the elders are overseers, um, and they're supposed to shepherd the flock of God. Okay, Acts 20 and 28 is interesting. We have to talk about this. Christological passage. Okay? I'm going to uh, take one of these. All right. Oh. Yeah, that's wrong. All right. In Acts uh, 20, 28, at the end, it says that these, these elders, they are to shepherd the church of God, which he, God, purchased with his own blood. Okay? So, um, that's, what, that's what the NASB says. Okay? All right. Uh, actually, the, 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 if you look at the Greek New Testament, they, there's a bunch of like textual changes here. Some people didn't like that, so they would change the Church of God to Church of Christ to make it easier. Okay? Um, so well, here's the problem, is that nowhere else in the Bible does it say that God has blood and God's blood purchase people. Okay? That's the problem. Okay? Except this phrase here, where it says his own blood, is not just his blood with just the, the basic um, a pronoun, like off to. It's not the basic like blood of him. Okay? It's actually the blood of his own where his own is regularly attested in terms of endearment to near relations, okay? This, I just gave you a copy of a page and a uh, commentary on the Book of Acts by a guy named F.F. F. Bruce. F.F. F. Bruce is a, was a major evangelical commentator um, at the end of the uh, 20th century, okay? Like, every evangelical knows who F.F. F. Bruce is, okay? And, and you know, he's, a, he's an evangelical, okay? So his tradition tells him something different than what he's actually going to say in this commentary, which actually makes it stronger. So it talks right here, uh, the underlying part says, the lifeblood of his beloved son, footnote 59, where it says Greek, which is dia to amatos to ebu, through the blood of his own. Blood. Should be. Huh? It says ebu. Of his own. Yeah. yeah. I said amatos for the word for blood. Okay. Mm -hmm. Via to amatos to ebu. Okay. All right. Um, should be translated here, by the means of the blood of his own one. In the sense of Evos is well attested in the papyri, where it's used in the term of the endearment of near relations. He's not saying the blood of his own is in like God's own blood. He's saying the blood of his own dear one, the blood of his own like 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 like, yeah, like my beloved like yeah. relative. Okay, you know, you know, dearly beloved, that sort of thing. So so it, it's a little ambiguous in here, but the way the NESV puts it where he purchased with his own blood, it really needs to be said, saying the blood of his own one, his own dearly beloved or whatever. So... Michael, you have an IV, right? What's it say? It's in Portal 28. Yeah, the end 28. It says, uh, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you to receive us. Be shepherds of the church of God, which you, which you bought with his own blood. Yeah, okay. and the thing is, it's not his own in the sense of a pronoun. It's the blood of his own one. As in that, that word, that his own is, is a noun there, not a pronoun. It's somebody else. And the point is this evangelical commentator, um, who's 
arguably one of the most influential ones in the 20th century, argues that this phrase means the, like the blood of his own dearly related relative. So this would mean the church of God was purchased with the blood of God's own dear relative, Jesus. Okay? Interesting. And some people don't realize like how potentially that could be a really bad verse. So, and of course, the, you can read in the if you have the apparatus of the Greek New Testament, you would see that uh, there's a whole bunch of like textual changes there. But um, this the phrase as it's written, the blood of his own dear one um, is is very solid. It's got a lot of solid attestation. Okay, so we we dealt with that. All right. Um, Paul warns the elders that wolves will come from among them. Why would they come from among them? Why would they not come from the outside? Mm, easier to spot from the outside. No, I'm just like, no. like, like, for, from an ecumenical standpoint, standpoint, how do wolves come from among the church? False prophets, false teachers. Who are the sheep squad? Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're people like they're not going to come from the outside. He's like, look, in the church, you're going to people that are going to fall away in the church. It says up there in uh, verse 29. I know that after my departure, uh, savage wolves will come in among you. Among you, not sparing the flock. Okay? Um, and from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things. So, like, people are going to fall away from the faith there. And they're going to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, they're going to be on the alert. And then he says in verse 31, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish you with tears. So, he tells us there that his entire period in Ephesus was uh, three years. I don't know if it's two years and three months, or if it's three years, or if there's a if he's rounding, or you know, something like that. Um, he calls into alertness and to remember Paul's admonishments. Okay? Um, the elders are exhorted to help the weak. You see there in verse 35. And everything I showed you by working hard in this manner that you will help the weak. Word for the weak there is the uh, noun, or sorry, the, the verb, um, the ones who are weak, the astineo. Some of you know what astineo means. It could mean people who are sick or people who are weak. It means weak here, okay? By the way, do you know where else in the Bible to where the weak or the elders are supposed to uh, handle the weak with the same word, astineo? James. It's in James 5.14, <clears throat> where um, it says that people, your translation will say people who are sick, but the word here could also mean weak. Here, obviously, the elders in, in 2035 are helping those who are weak. Not they're weak, but they can't like pick up like a boulder. They're weak in their faith. Okay? And that they're, they're to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, where it says, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Where does Jesus say this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Nowhere. 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 Luke actually, in the book of Acts, records the saying of Jesus that was not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Does Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John tell you everything that Jesus said? No. no. Even the book of John tells you that. Like, if we can write down everything that Jesus said and did, you know, like the, the world wouldn't be able to hold all those scrolls, okay? Um, okay, what else do I want to say here? Um, okay, after the speech, the elders gather to embrace Paul, to weep, and to kiss him. Okay, that makes me uncomfortable. Okay? It probably would make you uncomfortable as well, okay? But here's what we have to understand. This was a common custom of Jewish people. Somebody read uh, Genesis 33, 4. Then you saw Mary to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they loved him. Yeah. Okay? All right, what about uh, Genesis 45, 14 and 15? Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. Benjamin wept on his neck and kissed all his brothers and wept on them. That's the word that his brother is talking Yeah, who is he? Genesis 45, Joseph. Very good. Joseph. All right. <clears throat> all right. And then look at what Paul says in like nearly all of his letters. Greet one another with the holy kiss. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with the holy kiss. Greet one another with the holy kiss. Greet all the brethren with the holy kiss. Greet one another with the kiss of love. And so I look more into this. Well, let me ask you this question. How come we don't obey the Bible on these phrases today? Serious question. How come we don't do this? Cultural. Huh? Because it's cultural. Because we understand that these things were written to their culture, and we don't do this kind of stuff today, okay? All right? It's we know today that, you know what? The Bible has a certain application to its original readers, and it's a different application for us today. So how would Paul, what would Paul say today? What would be the modern equivalency? 
Or a handshake. Yeah, holy handshake. Or a hug. Or, or, or how about this? Holy fist bump. That's right. Boom. Okay. <laughs> so that's what Paul would say. Okay. But, you know, today it's like a, you, you see people in, um, in more sophisticated societies, they greet people, you know, they, they kiss each other's cheek or whatever. My grandma still does this. It's weird. I hope she doesn't watch this. Okay. All right. Um, but here's the thing. I, I, looked at this, I looked at this a little bit. There's actually a, a lot of evidence. Uh, kissing was a common feature in the Gentile culture as well. It's not just a Jewish thing. It's just part of their culture. Because Paul's writing to the Romans, Corinthians, and Thessalonians, and 1 Peter is writing to, actually the church is kind of in, uh, in, in like Bithynia, which is a little bit north of Asia Minor. Um, he's writing, they're writing to Gentiles. It's a common thing for them to do. It's how they greet people. Okay? You shake people's hands. Today, you kiss you back then. Okay? Relatives greeted each other with kisses. They did it during reunions. I know it sounds weird, but just whenever you would come into contact with people, like just like we saw here. Um, Esau ran to meet him. Who's him? Jacob. Jacob, okay. And then uh, right here, reunion of uh, Joseph and, and his brothers. That's just what they did. And it's just a basic sign of respect. Disciples would kiss their teachers on the forehead, on their hands, and even on their feet. The feet would be a really humble thing to do, by the way. Uh, kissing was so standard, by the way, that neglecting it would be considered as an insult. If you, if you greeted somebody and you didn't kiss them, it could be considered as an insult. And how was Jesus picked out when he was betrayed on that, uh, that Thursday night? He was greeted with a kiss. Okay? Okay? So it's just, it's just interesting. Like, you know, I don't think we, we deal enough with this. It's a social custom that they had back in the ancient world, and we just don't do this today. Although it's not so foreign because, you know, you know, like if you, if you meet someone, you're like, mwah, mwah, you know, on both sides. Like, it's just... That wouldn't be so strange to you, but we just don't normally do it every day. I'm not encouraging you to do that, by the way. So, but the funny thing is, these are actually all imperatives in the Bible. You're commanded to greet people with all the gifts. Amen. Yeah, the funny thing is that there's some translations that actually uh, that, that soften this out and act like it's not really there. So that thing is kind of funny. Oh my goodness. Okay. 1120, right on time. Okay, so for next week, what are you going to write your paper on? 22, 22, 22, 22, verse 3. And in particular, you're going to make sure that you mention and discuss. Strict. We're going to strictly mention strict. Yeah, you're going to mention this aspect of strictly, okay? The Greek word akribia, okay? All right. All right, you guys have a great day. Okay, it's got dust on the forehead. <laughs>